Oh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sunday Morning Amadicon panel, which we hope to form some English words out of our mouths to entertain you. Hello, hello. Please welcome Jeff Hampton and Rob Sheeran once again. Today, if we do something very special, we are going to look back in over Patrick Trouton's era as the doctor. We're going to start. We're going to start. We may not end there, but we're going to start there. Uh, 50 years ago today, or yesterday, um, <laughs> um, Patrick Charles made his first TV debut. Uh, so I'll very unoriginally start with an original question. What was your first viewing experience with Patrick Charles? Well, it, for me, I, I was a bit stupid um, when I was a kid. And one of the reasons I got into Doctor Who was I've been really, really scared of it with Tom Baker. I, I wouldn't watch it. I, um, my sister would watch it and I would actually get really angry and leave the room if I saw it was on because it just upset me. Um, and it, what got me into it actually was suddenly the realisation in 1981 when they did the Five Faces of Doctor Who repeat that, um, you know, that there'd be a sort of history to the show that wasn't just that, you know, and actually the idea of Strangely, that a, a, a guy came into my classroom at school and did a talk and had a list of well, every single story from our lovely child through to uh, at that point the uh, uh, got for this. And I, I, and I love lists. And I went and I, and I saw some five faces, but because I was kind of stupid, I didn't know it was, it was stripped over the course of a week. I thought it was weekly. So I remember catching possibly a bit of protons. But my first real experience with Contraptors was that I know for certain that I watched. So I went to <coughs> Longleat, the convention in 83, and I got my pens to take them, and I was very, very excited by that. And I went straight when I got there to this small tent, um, which might house maybe about 100 people, for an event that actually eventually got to about 30,000. I didn't get it. Yeah, I mean, so amazingly, I was able to get into that tape to watch the episodes, even though there was no room for anybody in there, even if it would actually only be ten capacity, which was ridiculous what I did. And I, but I got in, I went, I was first in the morning, I went straight to it and just sat down. And then I didn't dare get up. And they showed Dark Invasion of Earth. And that's two and a half hours, and it was on two very small TV screens, way at the front. But I still sat there, so I couldn't believe it was Doctor Who. And that was, it was new Doctor Who. <coughs> and then they began showing, showing the Dominators. And I desperately needed to go to the toilet. And I was really aching to go to the toilet. I mean, not to go into great detail, eventually, <laughs> sometime during the Quarks warbling, about maybe episode three ish, I just thought, if I just nip off very, very quickly, I'm sure no one would have suddenly take, take my seat, even though there were 70,000 people all trying to get onto my seat. And that was therefore my first traffic experience, was sort of trying to hold in um, a lot of urine whilst watching possibly the very worst Patrick Draper story anyway. But I still loved it, because as I caught with protons, what I found was that, because I love good stories, to be honest, they're not. They're, they aren't shiny examples of how good trout and stories can be. But he's <coughs> always amazing. He's always something actually that you just that your eye goes to. So yeah, I think. I mean, sorry, long, long answer, but I think it was probably a bit of protons and a bit of dominators, <coughs> and waiting action in some ways until Five Doctors, <coughs> which was he was so good in Five Doctors. I mean, he's the best thing in it. I, mean, I love Five Doctors, but he's the best thing in it. And actually, that's why I absolutely fell in love with him. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty much the same, not the, uh, trying to hold it in. Um, no. I didn't get into the Sorry. lovely exhibition, even though I drove, my dad drove me there. And I, he had a fight with John Pertwee outside, and I heard John Leeson's voice uh, as the announcement. But that's, that was the long and short of my long leaked experience. John, actually, yeah, I mean, John Leeson, you know, who was, Nick Briggs actually told me that uh, John, John Leeson spent most of the time for that first, first half day uh, of the convention, just making an announcement saying, 
do not remember that there must be parking in the you know, and all over the time. Every every three minutes you get John Eason interrupting the audio <laughs> of Dark Invasion of Earth. Like it was genuinely John Leeson doing it, but no one cared because he didn't care because it was just John Deeson. It was just K9. Mm -hmm. And eventually Nick told me that he was so angry that he, he stormed up. Because he was also there, I didn't know at the time. He stormed up and said, Would you please shut up? I'm gonna watch Doctor Who. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. He said, if you don't, I'm going to cut the wire with my scissors. And he cut some scissors. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't do it because, as he said, looking back, he could have killed himself. <laughs> but he was that furious. He said, I'm trying to watch Doctor Who. And he said, all right. And, and actually, he did after that, Nick says, calm down. But then, of course, Nick will never. And, he, and John Leeson has never forgotten. No, that's no. why K9 doesn't appear in the Big Finish as much as he that's why. Right, that's yeah. why it wasn't in the Sarah Jane audio, it's yeah. because of the, oh, uh, the well, long-standing animosity. Well, also because John's had panic attacks at the same time. difficulty is that John actually now just wants to Is that home. right? And, and on certain days he can't leave the house. Of course. And, and it's all because of Nick Reeves. Yeah, he gets David really to do his shopping. Sorry, I did No, 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 my my first memory of <laughs> Patrick Clout, Patrick Clout is the uh, Blue Peter clips, always the same Blue Peter clips. You always see the one of Peter Perfect shouting at William Hart uh, in from Dallas Master Plan. But there's always the the one of uh, 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 Patrick Trout, you know, being angry at the end of Trial of Time, at the end of uh, War Games. Yeah. That's that was the only clip you ever saw of Patrick Clout for 20 years until the Five Faces Lot Two, which. It's amazing because it's like nostalgia for nostalgia because yeah. th that was the first time you actually saw an old Doctor Who. You don't tell it was just earth shattering when it was on that first week, but you you kind of knew it back to front anyway because of its its folklore. But the Croton was an unknown quantity. Yeah, and seeing your know, Pat's performance, I think I read something in Doctor Who magazine. I don't know who said it, but it is interesting in these days of. Doctor Who being the character as being written, you give Doctor Who lines, you give Doctor Who uh, funny things to say. There is not a, a line that comes out of Peter Capel's mouth that isn't waspish and intelligent and witty. Pat never had a good line for these three years. He made everything <coughs> good by yeah. his performance. It was only after Pat left that, that he actually gave gags to the Doctor to, to John Pertwee, who most of them felt flat, but you know there was always those silly things about being used in Aikido and uh, you know the planet Delphon. There were actually jokes written into the Doctor Who dialogue, but Pat didn't have a funny line. He was just funny. He was visually funny. He made every line, no matter how dull, brilliant. Yeah. And uh, there, there was this kind of misnomer that they call him Chaplinesque. He wasn't Chaplinesque. He no. was. He was. He was doing the silent co comedian shtick, but he was doing it as Stan Laurel, because Stan Laurel was a silent guy who just happened to, to, to go into sound. But everything in his mannerisms, the way he poses for his photograph in Invasion, all the stuff that is all around the script, it's all around it. The, the, the scripts are really flat. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no actual physical <coughs> funny line. I don't know, I can think of a single gag in... Oh. Go on, go on, I get you, go on. Combat Seeds of Death with the leader wouldn't want you to kill me. I'm, I'm a genius. It's a good line. It is, it is almost a gag. I, mean, I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, part of the that, I mean, as you know, a few years ago, Toby Hayden, I don't know whether you do know actually, but we, um, we wrote a book um, trying to watch every single Doctor Who story, every episode actually, in order. So, you know, you'd write. And we wrote diary entries to each other across email, where we were trying to find all the really good things about every single episode. So you have to say, okay, see the death episode four, what, what's to say? And we do that. And what became really obvious to us is that, because we've never seen done it in order properly before, was that the Hartnell stories are actually better stories because they're braver, they're more ambitious, they've never known what the show is yet, mm. they're actually much more questing. The Troughton stories become very, very quickly actually a bit formulaic and clumsy. But he oh. makes them amazing, even though the, the scripts themselves are basically not as good. Mm. Troughton himself is such an astonishingly 
giving actor and he just is not prepared to let any scene die and wants to make it the best it can be. Um, me, I, I was at the <coughs> point of the, when they announced they had our Daughter Menace episode two. Yeah, and it's, you know, it was never an episode <coughs> that anybody actually well, I mean, I mean, we bought them all, yeah. but it, it, was, it seemed a bit unfair at the time. I mean, you know, they yeah. said, we got some more Doctor Who, and here it is, you've got a bit of Galaxy 4 and a bit of Underwater Menace. And, you know, I think the web of fearing the world thing up until that like, was, like was like a sort of treat. You know, someone said, yeah, go on, here's your real Christmas present. You know, it's like that they do to kids. But Troughton in that, I mean, I'd listened to the audio back when we were doing the <coughs> Andy Telly Snaps, you know, when we were doing the book. You suddenly just realise that all the things that you can't see in Troughton's performance are extraordinary. You know, the facial expressions, the way you'll hit his head. When you watch any of the world, you realise, as I think is the truth, that particularly once he got into his stride, he spends all of his time on the show, Patrick Troughton, massively, obviously flirting with the female guest stars. I mean, really, genuinely, mm. on, on and off set. I mean, he was a... Yeah, yeah, a, a wicked guy, guy Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. But, but actually, just what, also what sort of how that lifts it up. The, 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 the sort of crestfallen look he gives when he sort of romantic hopes for Astrid are dashed just because she doesn't even notice. But uh, uh, breathtaking, as you say, Stan Lorelich. Yes. I mean, and actually, that's part of the joy of him as well is that although he's always panicking, he's always in trouble, he has these moments of little fury, it's the optimism of, of him because he just keeps on bouncing back. I mean, that's why I th that's why he's my favourite Doctor, actually, because I can't watch him um, doing anything with Doctor Who without a feeling of tremendous joy coming out of it. I always get happy watching Patrick Trouble and stuff, even if it's a, not a very good story. In the contrast between um, uh, William and Patrick, or oh, William or something, Arthur and Patrick and Trouble, um, it's incredibly dramatic when you think it was a show aimed at kids that age wasn't only to accept a new actor in a row, it's a slightly different personality. Yeah. Well, I, I would sort of differ with that, because everyone talks it up, everyone talks of the differences between doctors, because you do, but the one thing you notice about William Hartnell's performance is, he's yeah, he's crotchety, but he's a giggling idiot for a lot of the time. He, he mm. is practically senile <laughs> as a time lord. <laughs> I'm not saying the, the actor is seen up, but he just giggles and, 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 and you know, and with his granddaughter. It's, it's, a, it's the warmest relationship you ever see in Doctor Who until the new series. So he, he, he comes across as a very, very angry in, in certain, but contrast. He is a smiling man. People adored him as Doctor Who. Yeah. They didn't think, oh, he's very stern, I don't want to watch Doctor Who. People looked at him as a, 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 a Gandalf, a loved, a loved, you know, you saw him in that footage of the, the air show of children just flocking to see Doctor Who. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, a bit of a myth that, oh, he's such a standoffish, and now oh, Patrick's in, now he's more engaging. It is true. <coughs> he, Patrick had a, more, a different approach to bringing, bringing the children in and was more engaging because of it. But I don't think it's like horrid man becomes nice man. It, it's yeah. I mean, actually, I've always kind of blamed James Nix for that. Terence. Yeah, yes. I mean, because I love Terence, but it's the way, because he was never worked far. And he came on board for Trout, and a lot of, and of course he's there actively for the rest of the show, but Harlan is the one doctor, is it his sort of only <coughs> remembering the doing of the, the old mobilization. Yeah. And I think his memory of Harlan, which is that he seems comparatively sort of building, of course, the opening story. We can just say that. Well, you know, the previous doctor, the, the thing about him was he, he would he, he would murder. He would try and murder cavemen. You know, in the what? It only happens the once. And yes. he's just, <coughs> most of the time, as you say, he's basically walking around just finding ter everything terribly amusing. Yes. Yes. And um, what what I thought was again when we were doing the corridors is that you could see the BBC turn against Harlem really obviously when John Wiles came along. And suddenly, in the middle of Dark Mastercraft, uh, which is where it starts, he stops not appearing in episodes until the last, you know, except for a few minutes in. He they just don't want him there, because they don't like him. Mm -hmm. And then they actively try and find ways of getting rid of the story. So instead of toy maker, they just say, yeah, well maybe if we were to make him go invisible and vanish, when we bring him back, 
could be another actor who does it. And there was a genuine attempt to try and do that. And then they, someone in the BBC contracts department got it wrong and sent him a new contract which he signed, so they had to bring him back in episode four to the Dormaker. Because that would have been the time for a new doctor. And then they say things like, oh, we've, before that time, okay, well, let, well, let's try in the savages, let's have Frederick Yeager play the doctor. Let's just have a story where someone just sucks at his knife essence. And we have another actor basically play the part. And I think actually what's interesting, and I've always, I mean, Frederick Yeager's a terrific actor, because we know also from Planet of Evil and Invisible Enemy. And he's, you know, and he, and he does, he, you know, if you listen to the audio, he's just doing a Hartman impression for the whole story once he absorbs the doctor. And I think it's actually a dry run to see if we replace him, can we get just some other actor just doing a basic impersonation of him? And you can't. And that's that's what's astonishing, is that they've said, okay, that didn't really work. We have to get somebody else in. We will sack him. But he has to come and do it and just do it as a different character. And in some ways, all those sort of false starts during the last season of Hartnell paves the way for someone to come on and actually just say to Patrick Troughton, right, you are doing it. You can't, don't try to impersonate, just do it something different. And of course, that's, I mean, it is still like driving off a cliff a bit, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it still seems in some ways like the most extraordinary contrast, but not because Hartnell was this sort of horrible, crotchety, caveman, murdering, <coughs> evil doctor, but, uh, but yeah, it's just a really, really brave approach. Yeah. On to the total change in the show, it seems to me, <coughs> to me, it seems at that point during Charlton's time was the first time they're openly acknowledging that we are in an action adventure series. At the end of stories, they literally go, "Oh, what are we going to do next week?" Yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and it's very much in the form of the TV Twenty Twenty One stars and fun. They often like to see. It seems to be leaning that way. Do you think those early series work in that regards? I mean, the, the, some of the new series <coughs> convention comes <coughs> from Billy figuring out the TARDIS. Who oh, were we this time? Oh, like yeah, uh, it's. It's, I don't think the kind of the ethos of the story of the story has changed. It's very interesting uh, for the whole first six years, apart from one companion, that all the companions are basically fleeing from something, or they're orphans, or they're stumbled into the TARDIS and they're trying to get back home. It's it, they kind of keep that kind of realism of yes, everyone's having an adventure, but in reality, if we we, we we're not going to explore the idea that. that the Doctor is giving them a better life, even though it's very dangerous. The idea of Victoria uh, fleeing from the Daleks and Jamie just being rescued from them. We feel good about that. It's that tension between saying, the Doctor's putting these people in danger, and uh, why? Yeah. And the only thing, only, the only uh, companion that doesn't happen is with, with a last minute rewrite <coughs> with Dodo, when she just wanders in going, oh, hey, Coppa, you know. And I'm in Barnes Common, and um, uh, let's go off on an adventure. It's that kind of ethos that brings attention into the Doctor's responsibility for his companions. Because when you start with the William Hartnell, we, we have two school teachers who are enjoying some of the adventures, but they really, really want to get back home. And then you, then Susan leaves, and you have another orphan. And then there's Peter, Peter Purvis, and there's, who's basically stranded on a, on a terrible planet. So there's no kind of problem about saying, well, why are you putting these people in danger? Doctor Who, and it carries on through that, and it's <coughs> once you get out of the black and white of the way, there is this tension because Joe and Liz sort of are there as their jobs, and then we get Sarah, who's a journalist who's volunteering to go with the Doctor, so it's only about 14 years in, but that yeah. tension... I, mean, I don't know, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think on paper you're absolutely right, um, because they do all have, you know, I mean, you can always claim that Jamie is fleeing the massacre, uh, you know, being killed by red coats. But I think there's also, it, 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 it's Troughton that does it in a way. There is a sense, which often people like Deborah Watt, you know, Deborah Watt would play against, because she actually is terrified mm. not to be there, and then she just says, <laughs> yes, well, what, why are we here? It's up there, the, the period from the deep is that wonderful bit in episode six. It's actually it's a really remarkable episode, because the story ends halfway through, which Dr. you never had done before. When you have half the episode of the match, she basically is dealing with the fallout of the fact that she's she's having traumatic stress. I mean, it's it, it, which Doctor Who never done before. You know, they, 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 they defeat the seaweed monster pretty quickly, and then they just focus on that. Yes. But the Jamie actually honestly travels around, having a brilliant time and finding it a series of adventures. And yet he's the one actually who is 
Mick, and Mick partly because it's because of Fraser, mm. who also just is obviously having an, an amazing time doing it in Patrick Charles. Mm. So you do get that sense, I think, of almost of these two psychopaths <laughs> <laughs> who, are, who are luring girls into the TARDIS, <laughs> who are going to risk being killed every week, and not quite understanding yeah. why these two are just saying, it's brilliant in here, isn't it? <laughs> and I mean, that the wonderful bit, uh, the bit which actually, again, I have a tremendous memory of as a kid, because I went off to uh, a convention when I was 13 years old, and it was probably, again, one of my first, it was my first Troughton experiences. We see Weber Fear episode one, you know, which for so many years, I mean, I adore Weber Fear episode one, and I assumed that that was all the Weber Fear I'd ever get to see. And it actually used to make me feel quite sad at the end of it, because it's such a good episode. But it's that wonderful thing, the opens cold on the end of your world, sat and sucked out, and, then, and it's a massive crisis, and it's all trying, yeah. to, trying to fall on the console. And then at the end of it, it turns, well, we did it, well, that was fun, wasn't it? And, 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 and you've got um, on the audio tape, which I was <coughs> at, at a convention, which I listened to every day for about 10 years, it seems. You know, um, Victoria just sort of, are we safe now? And not really enjoying it at all. And, you know, and, and Trapped and sort of reassuring her, but obviously looking forward to the next danger. And it's only seconds after they've mm. had this trip, you know, the world, they've only just finished that moment, and it's already new adventure, off we go. I wonder what we've got waiting for us next. I hope it's really, really dangerous. Yeah, that's, possible. that's superb. That's why Peter liked time flight so much. <laughs> yeah. He said, oh, you know, Abrick's dead. Let's go for a holiday to the cover. <laughs> oh, what can we find? Oh, Heathrow. Heathrow. <laughs> Now, Adric is dead, we are very sorry, but, on the other hand, yeah. <laughs> airports. <laughs> Actually, it's odd, that, isn't it? Because you look back, and you know, I'm not trying to change the subject at all, but it's go on. About it, but, I mean, but, you know, into, into that day was the thing. I mean, I remember being massively affected as a 12-year-old by the death of Adric. Mm. And for years afterwards, I was being told, particularly to speak about people by Peter, Peter Davis, and they needed to be accepted that they couldn't deal, you know, remotely credibly with the fallout of Adric's death in time frame. But actually, I look back at it, and that scene, and I remember at the time not trying to get a problem, they do try. It's not as if they actually honestly said, anyway, let's just get rid of it. Let's not even mention that again. <coughs> I mean, you know, the... This the, comes to a point, I mean... There's so much of that first episode which is tainted by Adric's death. Yeah, and you see him in, in, in later in, the, in that episode yeah. as a phantom. And we talk about Adric a lot, right up to the end of Caves of Andrews. Well, that's a spinal mm -hmm. isn't it? It's his final Adric, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is the first time that something actually resonates years down the line. A companion just keeps coming back because yeah. of the death. I mean, didn't do that with the Katarina or, or Sarah Kingdom. It, it's no, that's right. He doesn't start in the middle of such a time. I can say, oh, Katarina would have loved this. <laughs> playing playing Play my this. man's bum. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes. Oh, I, I do wish you were dead. Planet. If only Sarah Kingdom was here with that gun, but she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> she's dead now, Doctor. She's dead over Hartnell's final lines as he says, he says, he's about to go to travel, and I know to say, it's like, Hose, Katarina, and Sarah Kingdom, I am so sorry that I let you down. Old mother? <laughs> <laughs> old mother. Yeah. Old, old mother. Driving yeah. gum. First death, I think. Yeah. But no, it's, um, it, I mean, it's that way in which I, I think there's always that pressure, I mean, it's, it's true even now, between trying to deal with the, <coughs> with the sort of the realistic consequence of what these adventures would be, and the fact that actually, you know, and, and the fact that also that you wouldn't, in real life, well, want to travel around in these sort of horrible crises. Well, I, I just much, much I think I, made, I, I talked about this with David, David, Dave Owen. On an interview a year or so ago, because I'd written uh, the uh, the play about the curious incident of the Doctor in the night time, about the, the Asperger's child, and she, she, he meets the Doctor, and they have a lot in common. And I think that's probably a lot of autistic and Asperger's people like the Doctor because he's he acts like an Asperger's person because the the, the, the requirements of the, the children's thriller requires him to move on from from trauma and move on from death. Death happens around him. Death happens to him, and he just moves straight on, and yeah. he, the, the, the outside world doesn't touch him. So in a way, he acts in a way that, that, that they can respond to. Yeah, perhaps. Well, he, he is a children's character, 
and uniquely as a children's character, he's in a series in which lots of deaths happen. And uh, I'd say it's just that kind of like grey area between yeah. children's serials. Which I think as you get, you know, with the trout, I think you get that sense slightly more severely, which I think is, you know, what you what, what say, Mark, really, was that you, you get the sense actually at the end of, even the end of Power of the Daleks, you know, that he sits around in the, not as a spoiler, because of course he's definitely showing it, of course, the next few days, but, you know, at the end of it, he sits around and all, and all the destruction and says, oh, did I cause this? <laughs> and, 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 and for him, it's just, really, after the next adventure, I don't care about all the consequences of that, which because it comes a running joke. I mean, you know, the way that <coughs> that you get through Pertwee all the time and things like him saying, "Oh, come on, Joe, let's just slip away now because they, they 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 want to throw me a party." But I think I'll just go now because I don't deal with the consequences remotely of the fact I've just had an adventure here and everybody is grateful, or possibly. And morning. interesting enough, that yeah. is kind of probably for the first time. I don't know, maybe. Uh, Dr. Stephen Taylor have had some discussions about it, but the idea that he doesn't worry about the consequences is written into the series, especially in Evil of the Daleks, and when Jamie yeah. really gets angry at the Doctor for playing games, and it's the first time, probably since the Dead Planet, when the Doctor has actually seemed to be manipulating his companions, yeah. and not really keeping them in the loop and not worrying about their emotional state. No, that's right. And it, it, it's a running... Thing through right through and and as say Patrick yeah the, the Patrick <coughs> is quite amoral he doesn't mind about Victoria being quite really it doesn't stop him getting what he wants which is adventure yeah he's a much darker doctor actually than people well two that Simon shows him as his darkest I mean he literally walks into that adventure and starts it happening yeah and that is that's dark isn't it mm. yeah I mean, it's true he wasn't there. Yeah, um, eagerly actually opening the door, opening the door, and also then sort of solving all the problems and saying, "Well, I know what will happen if I do this. Is that you will probably end up dead. So here we go. Because <laughs> I want to see your chopping on. Don't I? <laughs> and, 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 yeah, that's right. Yeah. Even, even, even <coughs> in war games, I mean, there's that episode cliffhanger where he he sold them all out to Eddie Brayshaw as the war chief, and you still kind of believe it. He mm. kind of believed that sort of sense of betrayal. And he does make a very weak case in his trial. It's pretty rubbish. I would find him guilty. Well, I, I have a lot of sympathy with the Time Lords. In the, like the final Time Lord trial? Yeah, in the war games. So yeah. I just go, what? What are you talking about? This is no justification for anything you've done. I'm putting you on Earth where you can't. Yeah. Look, look, I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a picture here of, of a croton. Oh, a nasty... The Ooh. nasty head spinning South African. Then, yeah. Yeti. Oh, Sarah King. Oh, no, not that one. Go, go past that one. No, not yeah. that one. It not that one where they killed all the Daleks. It's hardly trial of time, is it? No, it doesn't go. No, it's not. It's not it's also so much more short. It's very short. Nice but, sure. but yes, it's, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, it, it isn't really any justification for the tool, which is, which is good. It's really good. You do think about it. Yeah. <coughs> Touch on something you said there about um, not facing repercussions. Yeah, a lot of transfers do end the same thing with them saying, well, no one's looking, let's go. Yeah. And yeah. not going to thank you. But something, do you think, <coughs> in the series as well, he seems to get thanked an awful lot more at the end of the stories. Do you think that's just like that? And then Thompson, and what's better? Him just slinking off and going, yeah, of course. Cheerio, sort out yourselves. That never seems quite happy. To there there is that time. I mean, I mean, again, it's partly, I think, because I'm old and grumpy now. But there was a certain time during David Tennant. I mean, there, there was, I remember actually, because it's coming up to Christmas, there was even in the trailer for uh, the next Doctor, mm. one with David Morrissey, you know, where they use it as part of a trailer. It's at the end of the story going, oh, we love you, Doctor Who, he's in a balloon. And I think, oh, really? I mean, there, there is a way in which I, I, I feel that the, the amount of love being shown sometimes towards the Doctor at the end of the story or during the story, that's kind of getting in the way of my accepting him as a character. Uh, you know, like uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think with but with any long running television show, a certain amount of reality has to bleed in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do actually take Rob's point that um, making the fans' idea of Doctor Who the same as everyone else's idea of uh, view of Doctor Who is problematic, and making him into this hero worship figure. 
isn't really what Doctor Who is. It's never been <coughs> that Doctor Who. I mean, he's made these statements, he made a statement of it in Dalek Invasion of Earth, like, I'm going to stop you. But most of the time, he just wanders away, or he's, he's treated with suspicion, and that tends to be the way. He wanders about, and he gets into trouble. He's not this some kind of god. But I, th I call it the Columbo effect. If you just carry on a series long enough, yeah. the premise becomes starts to fall apart because you know Columbo is this brilliant guy who kills, who, who mm. finds all these murderers, and but by the end of it, they're kind of like giving him a little bit of a promotion and they treat you with more respect. If you go you know, do 10, 15 years Columbo as they did, and still say, Ah, Columbo, you're rubbish. Why are you follow this this famous person around for no reason? Stop it. It just becomes ridiculous. Yeah. So after 50 years of Doctor, you actually have to say, okay, some people actually look quite favourably on him because he's saved the universe about 93 times. The point is how you deal with that reality within the TV series. I think it goes too far sometimes. I think you need to row it back. But if you just keep doing that thing over and over again, then, then it just looks ridiculous yeah. and a little stale. It's the same as you say about things like the X-Files, which you know, began to really bother people. Oh, yeah, you've got a wonderful premise there of a character who is, doesn't ever really believe you know, who's the sceptic, mm. who after 200 episodes or so looks really stupid at every single time. Mulder, it can't be possibly what you're saying, even though you're always right. It can't be that the shadows are eating people. That's just nonsense, Mulder. You're an idiot. Says, well, I think you'll find, according to my records here, that actually... I've done this quite well before. You're right. I mean, and the Doctor, of course, is going to bow down to that. It adapts to it. I mean, yeah. by, by ten years in, the Time Lords are asking the Doctor for help. You know, so you, you're accepting the fact that the Doctor is very good at this, rather than this, this kind of the invisible character who yeah. just wanders through time and space and, and screws around with people's cultures. It is perfectly possible within the universe of Doctor Who for someone him to land somewhere where no one knows about him, and you can have a, a Doctor Who episode like The Savages or like um, you know, any other story like that. But you have to have this kind of perception that he's quite good at this by now. Hero worship, mm, but yeah, the Time Lords have accepted that he's quite good. He's been president twice. Yeah. You kind of, kind of have to take that on board within the series so you accept it as a kind of vaguely believable story of this man. But yeah, I take your point on the hero worship. It can be a bit, bit shivery. Yeah, well, for me it does. Yeah, but again, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's also, I suppose, the way in which um, what you're saying, you know, the, what Trout and the Doctor starts doing, of course, is... You're very good at bringing this back to Trout. Well, yeah, well, I, mean, I, I, I like Trout, but it's about building in that, in that backstory, mm -hmm. the fact that it's only in Trouton's time that they actually start to nail the, the very end, who he actually is, and the fact he's a time world and all that stuff. We know, you know, most of Trouton's tenure is the last time that the show is still beautifully vague about what it is. Mm. From that point on, it's about saying, no, it's that, he comes from this planet, or naming a few stories later. And actually, as you say, normalizing it to the point that eventually the Time Wars will start looking after him and start sending him on missions. And yeah, it's, um, it's, it's the last one of the show. You're saying, what can we do? If it stayed in its state when you know, Bill Hart was doing it, it would have died has to evolve or die. And the great thing about Doctor Who is what it has become, what it is now, and with Pat taking over, is Doctor Who that is a TV show that actually thrives on change. And people look forward to change. The minute a new Doctor comes along, they're wondering how he's going to go. And who's the next Doctor after that one? And the minute a companion comes, they're going to wonder how is she going to leave? It's, 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 uh, if it's Star Trek and, you know, and, and Bill Shatner left after two series and there was another Captain, <coughs> it would have probably wounded the show, and you go, okay, fine. And and in any other TV series, if you replace the main character or you, you, you screw around with the cast, it holds it. Heidi yeah. High, for example, yeah. when the cast members leave, hello, hello, when the cast members leave, and then Dad's over when they lose James Beck. It's kind of like, oh, it's kind of like you're, you're losing, the, the water's coming out of the bag. But with Doctor Who, is, yeah, get that, you know, let's do more, let's change. What's the next Doctor like? Oh, we got Peter Capaldi, who's the next one going to be like? It, Fans always look yeah. forward to how is he going to deal with the Daleks? How's the next one going to deal with the Daleks? What are they going to do next time? What are they going to do? Yeah. And it's the, that change between William and Patrick which starts that going. I don't know if people were talking about who's the next one after Patrick after they did that because I wasn't there. But 
people must have been starting speculating, could he do this again? Yeah, sure. I mean, and again, it is the thing which I was always terrified about with the new series. Remember when they announced it was going back, and, yeah, and then I got on it. And, but I still always thought, it's all very well and good, and I hope the show runs forever. <coughs> but stumbling block will always be, can we pull off another regeneration? Can we pull off that moment when Hartnell becomes child? Can, can we do again, make the audience believe we can just change the lead actor? Because we got used to it mm. through accident, no, really by accident and by, and by just happy brilliance mm. of, what, of, of just how good Troughton was and how the audience did grow to accept that. But, you know, saying to a, rep, a modern audience who've never seen the show before, yeah, actually, we're, we're expecting you now to see this is going to run forever, this is going to change all, all of the cast. And the audience are watching it now, of course. It's as far removed now from where it began as it's ever been. It is really? quite surprising. It surprises me as, a, as an old guy, 47 years old, classic series guy, how much resistance there was to Matt when, when David went, because there were people who were just fans of David. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I just accepted I just, I just accepted Tom going, and I was such a Tom fan, but I look forward to the series moving on. I just wondered if that mindset is still there. I suppose it is, because we're now on Peter. I think it's much more it's acceptable because there is a narrative reason why it's happened to see the deal. When the <coughs> Harder changes to Trouton and when Trouton changes to Pertley, it's <coughs> never mentioned this is natural. I mean, it was only really when Pertley regenerated was the first time they actually said this is natural. Yeah. Before then, it was just like this is what we do. So it was something either which is no, like I think it was accepted within the show because, you know, when Terence wrote his Google Bible, his book with making of Doctor Who, he, he was, you know, that was during Pertwee's time, he's going, you know, who's going to be next kind of thing. It was, it was kind of that acceptance yeah. that there were three born. I think uh, Terence, again, helped, saying this is normal. You know, you know first Doctor changed, the second Doctor, second Doctor. I mean, God, the idea that how, how uh, Patrick changed is such a, a brutal thing. you just picking up, pick him up in the air and makes him change against his will. It is just, you know, it's not like um, the fifth Doctor heroically um, you know, getting done by Spectrox stop seeing it. It's just you say, right, you're changing. But that's it. I mean, it's such a brutal process. Yeah. And, and uh, I think if that happened now, if you'd say it happened to David, Tennant, there would be uproar, uproar just saying, if so, man comes down and just says, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's probably right, actually. You know, there's also the way in which... It is strange how those early generations, since we now call them that, actually almost deliberately try and make them harder mm. upon the audience. I mean, I think, I mean, again, I remember when uh, Russell had Chris change to David. It was the one time actually I saw, I, th I think Russell try to be really, really careful. I mean, everything about that change from Chris to David it's terribly carefully done. Mm. It's very, very smooth. It's, it's really saying, don't worry, really. Don't, please don't switch on. It's all going to be fine. I'm going to, you know, even that Children in Need thing he did, it's mm. all about basically a long scene in which he's trying to reassure the audience. I'm the same guy, you know, there's, you know, Power to Patrick. Power of the Well, I was just saying, all the time actually almost trying to resist the idea that he is the Doctor, which is. Well, that, it was Ben, is our voice going, is he the Doctor? And Patrick saying, yes, I am, I suppose. I suppose they're not handling it at all. It's pretty much <coughs> those first five minutes of Patrick going, yeah, well, carry on. They're yeah. just in the background. You just think, awesome. I and think it's written in, in the same kind of, I don't know if, if they would have had this. Is it just written in the kind of way that you would do with if you changed the cast member but was pretending it was the same actor? <coughs> it's like in a thing like Roseanne, if you just change one of the daughters and <coughs> you practically don't acknowledge it as much as possible. And by what? Ten minutes into into power episode one, just accept it. Forget it. Forget anything. We're not going to do anything else about it. Move on. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what David was going to have in his head. I'm sure there were things books written about it. Yeah. yeah. So I suspect so. Well, you probably find David Howell. David Howell. But yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it, it's just. It, it's intriguing that it looks almost incompetent. It just is the way in which how the guys so deliberately tries to not <coughs> any reassurance at all that, that the show is going to be all right. Yeah. 
and that those early scenes of Miss Troughton is actually giving the doctor it always in the third person and just not trying to remotely behave or, or reassure the friends around him. Yeah. And then actually also, and I think it's it's very, very witty, the first thing that Troughton's doctor does, he steps out of the TARDIS and, st in, and, get, and steps effectively into a dead man's shoes. He says, I'm going to now be this guy called the Examiner. I'm going to pretend to be the guy who's now dead. And if we go, you think, really? Is is that is there in any way a sort of subtle thing about what you have just done within within the show? I mean, it's, it's and, and of course that's deliberate. Yeah. It's, it's weird. I mean, the whole yeah. thing is kind of like um, the doctor needs to be the hero of the imposter and Daleks pretending to be goodies. The whole thing is about role play, role changing. Yeah. And uh, it's a great story. It is a great story. And the doctor not convincing really anyone that he is the doctor, not convincing anyone that Daleks are a danger. So he's basically in the position of if everyone in Power of the Daleks knew who Doctor Who was and had met William Hubble, he'd still be in the same position. <laughs> Look, they're a danger, I'm telling you. But if you know, you're 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 the doctor? No, I don't think you're convincing as yeah, the doctor. Exactly. <laughs> you're not convincing. <coughs> it's actually an entire story about how we can't convince people that actually is in a position uh, that he has any right to be doing. Mm. It's a, it, it's really, really clever stuff. Yeah. But it, and it, it's not accidental at all. It's not accidental, it just happens to be this sort of story. And, it's, and, it's, and I think it, at the time of thought, I think it is the most brilliant story Doctor has ever done. I think it's so clever. It, is it does story. contain one of my favourite lines, which is when Jackman kills a governor, and the dark turns and says, why can't you be this kid human being? Yeah, it's I mean, great. It's such characterization for a tin metal, <laughs> basically yeah. a tin prop. Yeah. And it, it gives you such great backstory and character for it. And it's just a few seconds in the middle of a six part thing. Yes, and that's right. Well, yeah. I think it's the, we, you know, I mean, it is known that we have uh, deliberately cribbed, I mean, I cribbed um, a power, you know, from power that I did Dalek. Mark obviously did with a big victory of the Dalek. <coughs> I mean, it's, it's just, it, 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 it's, it's actually too rich a story that you don't want in some ways. If you're saying, let's do a Dalek story. The one you reach back to is power. Yeah. It's the one which has has all the depth to it. Mm -hmm. There are also great, you know, things like Genesis and the Daleks. It's a great Doctor of Dalek story. Or well, Doctor Who story, but it's not a great <coughs> Dalek story. It's a great Davros story. Mm -hmm. But power is the one where they actually are cunning, where they where they where they connive, where they don't actually have to be saying, as they always appear to in most other stories, you know, we have no ability except to shout exterminate and make everything that we see <coughs> very, very obvious. These dykes are liars. It's amazing. They just go around and they try and subvert. And it's such a great, great script. I mean, it's, uh, it's beautiful, actually. It's too good for us fans because we've been trying to emulate it for so many years since. No, no. I, I, it, is, it is in our nature to reach back and imperfectly recreate the things of before. I mean, the, 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 <coughs> the, uh, I mean, I mean not to go on about it, you know, that's true. I mean, the, the night that. Dark went out, you know, Annika Wills phoned me up, never spoken to her before, but she was at a convention and she got my phone number from somebody. She phoned me up and said, hello, it's, and she said, it, it's Annika, you know, Polly, and I said, hello, and she said, and I was downstairs and there was a party of people downstairs, and we never some Moffat downstairs, Nick Briggs, and you know, we all have watching Dark, and she said, I just want to say, welcome to the family, which is a really lovely thing, and I just said stupidly, I just said, uh, I just nicked Power of the Dalek. She said, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> she said, it's fairly obvious, really, but, but well done. And it, but it was, it seemed to me at the time, I just thought, well, if you're going to rip off something, it helps that it's not in the archives as well. It helps actually that, you know, that no one at the BBC is going to turn around and say, so you're just taking really themes about, you know, I mean, I wanted to put a bit in Dalek, where, you know, <coughs> as a genuine rip, which actually we, we could probably would have done years later, but not at that stage of the series, where you had just someone peer at the, at the gun and just say, I can't imagine what this short, stubby arm is for, which is exactly from power. Which, of course, is terrifying, the idea of someone just staring down a dive gun and you know it's itching to kill him. So, so clever stuff. I mean, really brilliant. Right. It, it's, it, it's a broad thing, isn't it? It's, it's the, the, the theme is evil is stronger when you don't know what it is, and good and goodness, which is a doctor's weaker when you don't can't see it under your nose. So it, 
the Doctor's weakness is that in, 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 the, in the story is the fact that no one knows who he is, and the Dalek's strength is no one knows who they are. Yeah. So you have to find <coughs> out which side you're on first. Uh, and it's not completely clear um, to, to oh. the innocence of the, no. the, the, the characters. What, and what side do you actually root for? The harm, you know, apart from the Doctor, and the good, the good side can actually wipe down before the midway. Well, well, the other part yeah. about yeah. power as well is that you've got these ridiculous rebel, uh, this uh, storyline of power struggles between, mm -hmm. and, and, and you watch and you think, you're all just Dalek food, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and actually that's what's so funny, is you're watching all these sort of things between Bregan and Hensel, and you, and you, you kind of despise them both, and, you, and, and, and all those ridiculous rebels like Janley, and you think, you're dead. You're all dead. You know, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's the most fatalistic Doctor Who story. It's actually, yeah. it's strangely a bit <coughs> Game of Thrones. It's a bit which, you know, because I'm quite fond of Game of Thrones, but you know, it's, not, it's not that similar, really. But the way in which, from the fan perspective of Game of Thrones, I think, you're watching all these sort of ridiculously petty power struggles, and you think, there's a bunch of zombies coming. They can, they're all going to kill you in about, oh, I don't know, maybe another two seasons, <coughs> possibly. And you're, and you're not seeing what the main threat is. And power's all about saying, we care about our own particular threat, and we're going to ignore the fact that actually all of us, whether we're on the side of breaking or not, are going to be seen as exactly the same thing by this threat when it decides to kill us. And, and that's what's brilliant. And that is also the strength of having a doc. We were talking about seeing the doctor as a hero. And that is the good, good thing about not seeing the Doctor as a hero and having the Doctor as a stranger. That is the strength, of, and Patrick Trapp's era is particularly that, because he spends three years trying to convince people of danger, imperfectly, or sometimes, you know, most of the stories are, there's a bunch of people, a lot of them are going to die, yeah. how many is he going to save, because no one's listening to him. Yeah. And that is, is it, not just the base of the suit, it's, it's the second Doctor tries to convince people of the danger, and fails for most of the story. Yeah, and that's how you keep it going. Yeah. But has anyone actually seen episode one yet? Since it was released yesterday. And it was six, I guess, if I'm mistaken. No, really? I'm telling you, the hours went out wrong. Oh, no, 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 they always do that. They, they corrected it after like about two hours, but a lot of people mentioned grab all six. Uh, okay. And including all the DV extras went out exactly the same time. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I, I, did find it, I found it very odd. Yeah. I went on to Twitter last night after I went to my room to get a bed. And there's a, there's a video of me talking about it, because I'm on the extras, because I, I did the commentary. <laughs> you know, that they even, the, the commentary is filmed, it's bizarre, I didn't know that. I was saying, why, why am I there with headphones on talking over Power of the Dark Star Paul? Why is this now a clip on Twitter? And I thought, who's put this up? Someone so, filming you without your knowledge. Yeah, it's the BBC for you, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. dun, dun, dun. Don't worry, I've seen the YouTube channel, it doesn't go up any hits, don't worry. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying things I don't want people to know. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's strange. It's, uh, uh, that, I mean, I just, I'm excited by the idea that at the moment we have power of the Daleks going back on, on an episodic basis over this week. This makes me feel very, very happy. Um, yeah, yeah, such a good story. So moving on to the next story was um, the Highlanders, the last yeah. historical for a while. Yeah, I suppose it was really. Did, uh, was the format weak or was it just weak scripts? And does Trousers and Stock really work in the style of the step back and let it play out that the Hartwell character did? Or? Uh, I think there's no such thing as the, as the proper historical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just that everything's, <coughs> you know, the early historicals are all about the idea of there's a bit of education here going on, and the Doctor doesn't really fit into it. So he has to observe, and it's like, it's like, you know, your Doctor who discovers stuff in, in, in the The Doctor who discovers Marco Polo. Except we're going to go travel around and look at Marco Polo, and, and we'll have a narrative explaining why, why, why he can't go. I don't think it's a but question of the historicals going out of fashion. It's a question of the type of story in which the Doctor lands in a situation with his companions and has to survive which is a hallmark of the early Hartnells. They basically land there, and, and they get separated from Dunge, and they get back. Yeah. A Aztecs, a and, and Dead Planet as well. There's not kind of a question of fighting against, there is a Dead Planet, obviously, but a large part of that is the, the TARDIS is screwed, we have to go to the city, you, you manipulated yeah. things, oh, there's radiation, there's a problem. So it's a question of getting over the various problems and surviving. When it's moving into the Patrick Chan era, it's a question of a, a man, a, a, an alien, 
fighting against dark forces across the universe or dark forces on, uh, on Earth. And the historicals, which is just about survival, because you can't really interfere, they're going out of fashion because they're not fitting the format anymore. Yeah. The problem is with historicals is you can't change anything. And if you do end up fighting, it's normally the bad guys that win, because that's what happens in history. And they come as a result of any airless. And that's actually why they begin to get <coughs> into quiet. To actually draw the good comedies. Mm. You know, Roman starts that. By the time you get to the inside, Donald Cotton was the famous you know, fighters. Mm. They're, they're really brilliant scripts, both of those. And Highlanders and Smugglers, I think, you know, that those, those last two vast movements of them, I think they're just beautiful. I think Highlanders is a gorgeous story. It's really, really funny, mm. but, but also it's, it has a really dark edge to it. But and so in itself, there's no re because Trap is so good at comedy. There's no reason why I should stop there. But, there's no but, reason. But I, but I think the actual format is a little bit. It isn't. I, and also, I, mean, I, I don't really know that the you know. And also, it's a it's a question of show perception. The show perception is now about the Doctor meeting lots of aliens and fighting for you know fighting against mm -hmm. something. Um, and Highlanders, as you say, you're fighting against. I mean, well, I, th 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 there's a lovely Doctor Who book. I can't remember what it's called. I got when I was a kid, um, probably for one of the anniversaries or something. And it, what it does is it has all the story titles. And it has, you know, written by Cobham. And then it's uh, enemies, <coughs> you know, and you think, oh, yeah, that's right. So, you know, you've got Daleks and Cybermen and that's what And behind it, it's just got. It's got, you know, it's got uh, Solicitor Grey. <laughs> it's really not, you know, stick on. Um, but it, and it looks weird to have actually the idea. Yeah, it's like that's been it, it, in the magazine, what enemies, the French. It's a kind of... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring that one back. For the, time. Uh, yeah. the, point, the point is, uh, yeah, the thing that's about historicals is the premise being is Okay, outside that door, there's, there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of drama happening out there. We have to avoid this drama at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's an odd premise for, it is. for, for, for a, a, a site, well, a, a super children's serial thriller. Uh, there's only so many ways you can avoid the drama and yet get involved in the drama, and it becomes repetitive by, the, by that, that constraint. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's what's funny about those early Hartnell stories is that it gets so cheap on imitation. It's like that bit in sensor rights. Where in episode one, a sensor right, for no reason at all, just pointlessly steals the lock of the TARDIS so and they can't just go. Mm. Because other, in fact, you know, and, and it takes ages actually for there to be a story where they just happen to have an adventure and, they, and, and the TARDIS is not yes. actually incapacitated. Because which is, it, which we, is understandable. We talk about realism, we talk <coughs> about the new series being more realistic than the old because of our. Uh, the 20th century Earth, the, art, the companions we identify with. But there is real, there's a huge amount of realism in the early stories because anyone landing in an unfamiliar place where there's danger would want to get right back to the Tardis straight away. And uh, again, we got back to that with, with, with the Peter Davison era, which people said, well, let's just go back to the Tardis and let's stay in the Tardis in, in the middle of a story like the Visitation, which to me seemed quite realistic. I would go back there quite often. Yeah. You know, like in State of Decay, I'll go back there and do some research. That's yeah. fine. I don't. I, I find it unconvincing. You just leave the TARDIS. And the TARDIS is there. And you go back in time and you get involved in adventure. And you, you don't come back. You don't think about this wonderful resource you've got. And it's what I like about. Well, actually thinking about not being able to get back there. <laughs> yeah. And if you do, if you can get back there, use it. Yeah. But it's also that sort of realist. I mean, I mean, I remember having a phone call again. Doing sorry. But, doing darling, uh, from Helen Rayner, I liked her. She said, uh, we've had a real problem with your script for, it was back to be filmed. I said, oh, that isn't what you want to hear. She said, uh, Mal Young's at it, he just says, um, I, don't, I don't understand why the TARDIS happens to bring the Doctor to a place where there's a darling. I mean, that's a bit of a coincidence. <coughs> and I said, right? She said, so how are we gonna fix that? And I said, what, what, the doctor just, it's always what happens, which is, yeah, but we can't, we can't accept that because it's not realistic. So we have to find a way. <laughs> so that's why we build into the to, to Dalek, and I hated doing it. The Dalek distress call, which I thought was against the character of what I was writing. It was going to be like it was inert. But we have this distress call because otherwise, and you can see in those early stories, there has to be, 
you go into a story because a reason is given for why that could happen. And I said to Helen at the time on the phone, I said, if this show takes off, no one will think twice about the Doctor just arriving on a planet where there happens to be at the, the very moment of the adventure starting, because that's what storytelling de demands. She said, that's possibly true, but we can't get away with that at the moment. And she, was, and she maybe she was right. The same thing is probably therefore true with early Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. you, you keep on having to put in a barrier that, oh, the time, I mean, actually what's funny about Terry Nation's scripts is that he does it all the time, yes. up until Destiny. We don't need it anymore. You know, Destiny has this bit where all the, all the scaffolding falls away all the time. So he goes, oh my god, we, we couldn't run away now if we wanted to. And you think, you weren't going to, because you never run away now. And that's not the format it's of the very David Whittaker really, really thinks it through quite heavily. He, he, he was the makeup of the character. <coughs> what what, 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 what <coughs> the uh, production team do? You know, the, 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 the granddaughter who stays with the Doctor out of royalty. The two school teachers that blunder in, and the Doctor can blame them for blundering in and causing him to leave. It's all very intricately and realistically put together. And when the format changes, the cracks start to appear and going, well, why, why are you doing this? I know we've always had companions, but there's always been the reason, you know? Yeah. Why are you having this adventure, Ian and Barbara? Well, because we have to, because we have to travel from place to place, because one, you know, the one planet we might land on is 20th century Earth. So we keep landing from place to place and leaving, and then we get separated from the TARDIS. There is no reason why it Man's good man, well, you know, there's no reason why. And it's also actually why you've got later on the, the oldness about when they try and bring that back to a character like Tegan, mm. where, you know, and, 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 and her needs get so specific, you know, because with Ian and Barbara, it's about, oh my God, can we keep going, oh, we, how are we this time? Oh, it's 18th century France, and we're still not home yet. With Tegan, it's, yeah, well, I am kind of home, I mean, I could get the bus, but I want it to be specifically Tegan <laughs> Terminal 5. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not getting off. Oh, Doctor, you've taken me to Hanzo. I don't, Hanzo's not good enough. You, you've got to fire this crane. And you think you could really just give it. 20th century Earth is so, such a common destination at the time when, when, when she's saying, I'm trapped in the TARDIS, and, and it just seems to be inconvenient. You're not dropping me off at exactly the right point. It just seems like it's so, one of, so, so. One of the legacy from Chris Bidley to overthink. Yeah, I, I always wondered because if Tegan did get to London exactly where she wanted, surely the police would be there waiting to disperse them about dead Auntie Vanessa. Well, <laughs> I, 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 would, I, would, I mean, I like to believe actually the doctor set her up. You know, so at the end of her direction of the Daleks, when she says, I've had enough of this, and he thinks, oh, dumped by Tegan. <laughs> Luckily, I know I've set certain wheels in motion to make sure that she has a good day's work, a good day's uh, happiness in her life. She'll see me in jail. Which I think would be really good. Well, yeah. Yeah. Tegan can still have a part of their bodies in the warehouse, etc. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. not yeah. looking good. We, we, we can just pin this on Tegan. That should have been a bit more serious. Yeah. <laughs> Tegan is a sort of now sort of massively tattooed <laughs> woman sitting in jail waiting to get any form of possible release. Oh. You know, she, she's just doing weights in the cell. <laughs> saying, right, One day I'll see him again. Yeah, yeah. That, the big finish. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. We should, say, we should say, we should say the big finish. We want to do a prisoner cell block H yeah. kind of series. <laughs> <laughs> Australian prison and Tegan's in there. <laughs> Everyone Australia who's been in the show. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, him from memory of the world, he'll be in there. Yeah, he'll, be, uh, he'll be arrested. He'll be, that'd be fine. Sorry. That was nice. But that tells me it's 11 o'clock. Oh, that's good. Yeah. For no reason. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's about time you started talking. Yeah, to sorry. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, we just want to. Do you have any uh, points to make, issues to raise, um, points of order? Yes, yeah. sir. Not really simple, but there are. A couple of people in this audience who can remember watching Patrick Troughton when it was first on telly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? The desiccated ones at the back. I mean, how did that actually feel? I mean, I mean did it seem. I mean, do you, actually, do you remember the actual transition? I mean, were yes. you around. So, so, did you resist it at all? Did you find that all right? It, it was a long time ago. It, it seemed strange and. Um, was sort of remarked on, and it was a general theme of what was going on because I was watching it at the uh, boarding school. Yeah. Um, with a lot of other people my age. Um, but I think it was, uh, it, you know, the, when it carried on, it was accepted, yes, that the doctor's changed, but it's still the doctor kind of thing. And, yeah. And you know, just going on. Yeah. I think well, that's it was still a lot more naive in those days. 
things, you know. I mean, television was amazing. You were just what? Well, true. What it is a strange magic box. I mean, yeah. yeah. I remember William Hartman. I might be wrong or right, you know. But no, that's how I remember. I must admit, I mean, I agree because I'm also obviously of an age where I want older doctors. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, mean, I, I remember when I, I mean, I knew David quite well before he was cast for the doctor. And I, but he's younger than me. And that for me was a sort of a <coughs> point in my relationship with age that I was an older doctor. And, and then I met Matt because I, so I worked on the Matt Smith first series for a few months. And it's odd just to meet somebody and say, oh, you're, you're Doctor Who, are you? Because you're, you're like a child to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's odd. So when, so when they asked me to Capaldi, I thought, yeah, he's older than me. That's good. <laughs> uh, the one thing that just hits me a lot when I get older is the fact that I'm now older than Tom Baker would have left the series. <laughs> and I just feel, yeah, yeah, Tom looked like he was just about ready to die in him and look off this. How old was Tom when he left? 46. 30, that's my age. 39 yeah. when he got in and 46 when he left. No, that's not yeah. true. <coughs> that. Hey, that, that just rings to me a lot. Oh, well, that's, that's actually quite terrifying. It is. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's also, it's, it's a trick of things, knowing that <coughs> Peter Davison is now older than Hartnell. Um, uh, uh, I mean, at any well, point. Probably is older than Hartnell. Yeah, it? which is strange. But, I think yeah. the, the, the transition is great. It is unique. Because to have, I don't know that many... In, 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 say, uh, in, in transition of a main character, I think in, say, Babylon 5, when you replaced Garibaldi with Sinclair, you acknowledged it, and you carried on him, and you hoped, and luckily Sinclair was a very engaging character, and you didn't leave Garibaldi, <coughs> not Garibaldi, it was the first guy, Sinclair to Sheridan, sorry, Sinclair to Sheridan, and you acknowledged that changeover, and you still talked about <coughs> Sinclair, and uh, that seemed to be a story that was on running on, but I don't know of that many shows in which a change of character actually helps the show. Yeah. At, at best, it keeps the show going sort of all right. I mean, next, at Star Trek, you have to start a new series with a new cast. It can occasionally be a bit of a problem. I, I know that Matt Smith said that um, he was felt a little bit slighted. You know, that he was the doctor that, that when they announced him, everybody in the country said, well, we don't want to lose David Tennant. So he spent a year waiting for people to, to possibly start approving of him. Mm. But, but he's also the doctor, he said, as soon as they announced Peter Capaldi, everyone said, yeah, can't wait for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he felt about when he left, he was, he was waiting in the, sh you know, he was, people just waiting for the next doctor. Mm. And so he said, you know, going in and going out, he felt a little bit unwanted. So it's just, just yeah, rather, yeah. rather a shame. I think he's been the strongest. I think that's great, yeah, yeah. but, 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 it, but it's, it's a, I think the danger, which I find narratively, actually, is the way that I, I, I find our reliance upon the actual get-out of, of a generation a slight problem for the heroism of the show. If you know that, actually, it's like a video game where you've got this number of lives, then the fact you're making a stand you know, for the truth and justice and, and actually being brave counts for less if you think, yeah, but actually I'm, I'm kind of immortal and I could just change it to Peter Capaldi. Mm -hmm. And I used to love the fact that in the old series, when, you know, the Doctor would say in Terror of the Zygons, right, I'm going to hold that ganglion and that ganglion, it might electrocute me. It, I don't know, i better give it a go. He wasn't thinking, if I do that and do that, I'll turn it into Peter Davison. Because mm -hmm. that means it's, there, there's nothing at stake. Yeah. And there, there was a way in which I, I like to believe, I mean, even when David's <coughs> regenerated at the end of Andrew's army, he says, I might regenerate, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's a danger, I think, with the way we now so accept change from Doctor to Doctor, mm -hmm. that the Doctors themselves also seem to accept. I mean, I began to find that again a problem. Although I do love David Tennant's Doctor, and I do love that time of the show, the fact that David spends all that year yeah haunted by the idea that at some point you'll change into somebody else. You'll say, get over it. Yeah. It's a tremendous <laughs> gift to people who've got that. How about you just stop running away from your from your inevitable demise in the end of time and just accept and just, you know, just, just man up, I think. Yeah. Because you actually are going to turn into somebody, you are still going to survive this. Mm. Idiot. 
Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Says it's all over now. And also the actual cruelty of it, which you we can get later with Donna, yeah. but the cruelty actually of being saying you're now going to have all those adventures that you have for me, they're going to be taken from you and you'll not remember anything except our first encounter. Of course, I hate CBC wiping the archives. Yeah, well, yeah, I did a bit. Yeah. So, but, it's, but it's hard. I mean, I, I found the end of War Games heartbreaking. Most of mm. that, it feels, it feels so cruel. It does. You know, that yeah. Zoe will only remember the weird in space. <laughs> <laughs> it is a metaphor. We only, we only, only the crap ones are left, and the good ones have all been wiped from yeah. memory. Oh, yes. Uh. If only Philip Morris would come along and restore it memories. <laughs> yeah. That's the fan in it. Philip Morris would edit himself into the, um, the war game. Uh, like it's, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. not a giver that they have proper endings. Again, we, we get onto John Pertwee and Liz just disappears. Yeah. We don't have that many proper endings for companions because they all get suddenly decide to leave or they don't believe they're going to leave as, as actors. And then suddenly there's this sticking plaster. So it's great that. Uh, <coughs> In the midst of a lot of the chaos of the Patrick Chowton era, they are, they are actually doing these things. Because, you know, Terence is always saying, oh, this, this, this episode dropped out, that episode dropped <coughs> out. It's good that he actually had enough of a handle on it to give them a proper out. Yeah. I mean, Joe's exit, again, it's, it's great. We had to wait a long time. You say, we didn't get Liz, we got Joe, we got uh, Sarah Jane Smith. But even that one is... It's abrupt. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's very well done. Well, has there ever been a, a story story for a campaign where it's a campaign all the way through, or is it something like the last 10 minutes or five minutes? So, what story? Has there ever been like a story where the subject's been purely on the companion for the whole story that culminates in the reason for leaving? <coughs> that's a bit Or is it always that last five or 10 minutes? I know it happens. I mean, you know, you can sort of sense that it actually it begins to be built in, doesn't it? it it's that sense of thing that. Right, well, it's Turlo's exit story, so we better make it, um, we'll, we'll explain all of Turlo, and then he can go. And, you know, even, you know, uh, Adric and Earthshock is actually a very, very good example. Yeah, that builds up, that's just, there's a couple of scenes you can tell something. Yeah, that. but actually, occasionally, it becomes almost a bit forced. You think, hang on, this character, I mean, hasn't really done very much for a while, and now they're starting to act a little bit as if, as if maybe things are going on, then we'll be leaving it. And, and of course, you know, it happens a bit with, you know, I mean, I mean, I spent all the Resurrection of the Daleks when I was 14 years old, um, wondering when they were going to kill off Tegan, because I knew she was going, because I was a member of Dwas, mm. and I thought, oh, this is be good, because after Adric, actually, I got spoiled, I wanted every single companion to die. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought that would be really dramatic, you know, and, and, then, and then they all, you know, obviously they get killed Nicola, yes. and then they changed their minds, yeah. which was weird. It's a shame, really, isn't it, in a way? But I, I, I just remember Nicola feels about it now, but it's well, so she, dramatic, the idea of Well, now I've written the sequel, The Widow's Assassin, she's much more at peace with it. But it's kind of bad plan. It's weird. It's a weird kind of episode, because everything in Trial of a Time Lord says that uh, Harry survives to the audience, because you've had a whole story about unreliable narrative. Yes. In the middle of it, a companion dies in a shocking way. If there had been planning from Eric and John, if you'd actually presented this story as a whole, you'd go, okay, in episode 13, those two witnesses who turn up in their little silver coffin, that one would be Savalon Glitz to explain the plot, and one would be Perry yeah, exactly. to actually show up to say, here is evidence that the Matrix is lying. The fact that Bonnie Langford's in it just completely <coughs> just skewers yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the Nicholas' departure is mm -hmm. it depends on the the two main characters in the story, the Doctor and Perry, acting so completely out of character. The Doctor leaving Perry there, Perry leaving with the Incarnus without waiting for the Doctor. Mm. Uh, it, yeah, it's bizarre. It's planned, but they're not planned. Yeah. But it, it's obvious what happens. It, it reminds me, in the sense of Nick Mayer talking about the Wrath of Khan and saying, oh no, we yeah. have no plan to bring Spock back. And the whole thing about Wrath of Khan is about resurrection and about life from death. And you go, seriously, you wrote this whole script going, oh no, he's I didn't expect them to bring it back. But you wrote the whole story with this huge trap door. It's, it's actually a terribly clever idea if you say, OK, they're doing a story about unreliable narrators. It's like the shock moment halfway through of saying the lead character's dead. But it obviously, you've actually got to then pay that off. It's a bit like Invasion of the Dinosaurs. One of my favorite Invasion of the Dinosaurs is when, is when, you know, the episode two cliffhanger, where she wakes up and it says, oh, it's several months later, we're now on a spaceship. And I always wanted, when I was episode three, I always wanted that that storyline is kept going. You don't go back to Earth and see 
doctor for mm. ages. Mm. But actually, of course, we do. We, in fact, there was about two minutes. Mm. And it's sort of moves. I think keep this an eye going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually, the brilliance of trial potentially would be in episode eight, you actually say, yeah, Nicola Bryant's gone and she's dead. And then later on, she's not there. You know, the actual fact that she could come back and actually be part of that evidence would actually be really that this gun on the mantelpiece that isn't really fired to her device yeah. is, is handled really badly because they sort of fire the gun in a kind of lame way and the ball falls out the end of the musket at the end of episode 14 when they go, oh, well, she's really gun. So it's a complete bumble. Yeah. But if you're writing now with the, and knowing that Nicola would stay for the whole series, then you, you do it like that. Yeah, that's the story. So but actually, it's not unlike what they did with Clara. You know, they would say, okay, she's dead in the face of the raven, but in fact, she's there for the whole series. But you're being given, she is going to be, but it's not quite the way you anticipate from the fact that you've got, yeah. you've got that sort of false note, which is quite clever. Mm. And a bit frustrating as well. Mm. But well, that's a question. On the companion journeys, allegorical kind of to young adult life, would you be in a person to get dreadlocked and steal traffic cones? Yeah. You drink things you shouldn't, you yeah. things you shouldn't all the weird stuff and you have all that adventure and fun and then you cut your hair you get a job you meet the man or woman of, of your old dreams yes. and you go back to a normal sane sort of one and to some extent the, 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 you say and to go out and they're having wild adventures and quite a few of them that's what I mean Jill meets the man of her dream real man of her dreams yeah. I've had my fun but this is where I want to go yeah. and maybe yeah, but it tends to be. I'm going to be mad and saying I'm going to be a student. It, it yeah, yeah, yeah. On, yes, on a universal summer uh, summer break, and then I'm going to grow up. Yeah, yeah. Which I, yeah, I, I, I occasionally sounds old. <coughs> the bit which I've always found very, very funny is when Nissa does that in Terminus. You know, and Nissa suddenly just says, "You know what? I've actually I found myself a summer placement job, Doctor. I'm going to be working out in Seven Company." And then she says, "You know." I've loved every minute of my time on the TARDIS, but I think the holiday, you know, I think, except for the bit maybe where everybody on her planet, including her family, were brutally murdered. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this wonderful time. But I, 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 I wanted to say, I think my favourite bit was actually when I had, when I, was when I slept through Kinder. I, 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 I quite enjoyed that bit. But it's that bizarre thing actually that her reaction is one of saying basically, one of, um, yeah, okay, I think I found myself a nice job. But it's like, it's like one of those sort of things where you're sort of busking around for a while and waiting to get some responsibility. Which I mean, which, which actually, which ultimately works. You move on. I mean, it's why, you know, we always react badly to the departure of, um, of, of, of dear old Louise Jameson, mm. the invasion of time, because it just seems, I mean, give her any other exit. I mean, just have her say, it's like, you know what, Doctor, they want me to be in charge of the Gallifreyan Guard. Mm. Yeah. You know, all that'd be good. Mm. There has to be that she marries Andrew. Mm. I think I, I think that he's hypnotised her. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other way, really. really. Mm -hmm. The doctor has got a gun out of shot and he regenerated as you fancy him now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which of course he would now do. He'd yeah. do that in hell bent. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is that all right, Leela? No, relax. All right. <laughs> we'll try again. Oh, you yeah. have <laughs> 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 oh, oh, I mean, we got Andrew, we'll try again. Uh, or alternatively, yeah, you know. Yeah. He's now black Blackboard. Yeah, I'll go with that. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like that Moffat running joke in Fatal's head, isn't it? Well, you know, not the kids regenerate. Yeah, but he goes into Jim Vaughan, but doesn't want to marry him. And then, of course, Joanna got me at the end. Yeah, that's quite funny. Anyway, yes. Anyway, uh, anything anything else? else that anybody wants to interrupt our ridiculous matter? Run to the back, sir. Yeah. Um, as you said quite early on, most people recognise Darwin as just being single minded, would wipe everything out, but you've got the vision. <coughs> but one bit I did like in the new Doctor Who's report, as in Post the Gap, yes. uh, was when you brought in the Cult of Scaro. Yeah. A wonderful conversation with the Cybermen where the one line was, What are you? Pest control. Yeah, that's a good line. That's Can I just go? Um, I need to go to the toilet. Okay, yeah. I'll be back in two minutes. Can yeah, you sure. talk about that? Yeah. I'll just be in two minutes. Let's talk about something, right? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Was yeah. there something I said? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just didn't say guess. No, it's, right. it's great that. I mean, obviously, the, the problem you've got there is that you've got Darks and Cybermen, and the Daleks are obviously going to be. 
in Russell's view, they're the most important. <coughs> so cyclamine do come off the land of that quite badly, but it's a very, very windy line. It's great. Yeah. Well, just that thinking out the other. Darling that thinks outside the box. Yeah. Well, that's what we were trying a bit. I mean, obviously, I wasn't involved in that, but, you know, I mean, that was a year after I went. But, yeah, but, yeah it, it's, it's, it's a good story. I think it's really good. Yeah. Um, what's the most embarrassing thing you know about Mayor? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's this bizarre thing that I mean, you think he's now going to the toilet. He's not. Um, he has he has a certain he has a certain sort of almost physical sort of uh, bad reaction to people bringing up Cybermen at all. If he does that, he's actually now he's probably now theme six somewhere. <laughs> He'll come back in a bit. You pretend he just went to the toilet. He didn't. He's, he's losing his breakfast somewhere. <laughs> he's very, very scared of them. And he's basically just scared of anything to do with uh, humming and saints. So, uh, which monster from the series um, traumatised you then? Um, actually, I was scared of Daleks. I mean, I, when I was a kid, uh, I was scared of the Rod Hunnam you deadly dustbins. Remember that? You know, because because I could not. I was too scared to watch Doctor Who, but but they had the that, that sort of parody version on Rod Hull, and you'd have the these dustbins coming around eating people. <laughs> and I found that actually terrifying. So, because I, I just imagined all Doctor Who was like that. And it was a bit. So, yeah, it's a, yeah so for me, I, I never liked the idea of Daleks at all. I was really, I'm really scared of one. Yeah, so he's cut me over to a member, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, how, 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 was, was, how was the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited talking about. Um, yeah, of course you did. Yeah. Yeah. No, that doesn't work. I wouldn't say Perry, but that doesn't really work. No, it yeah, doesn't. No. Anyway. Yes, yeah, James. James. Rob, when we last here, was they were actually filming the first Cyberman story. They were. So, we had a little bit of what was coming in. Now that Cyberman come back, yes, it'd be the, the first. Cyberman Dalek match. <coughs> I was unhappy that these were like the two greatest warring nations in the universe. And when it first face to face, it was 10 0. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was a problem actually in there. Why did you with that? You know, I mean, I, it seemed to be actually, again, I'm, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not possessing Russell because I think Russell's great, but it seems to be narratively odd. You have an entire, you know, every season of Russell, you've got the return of some. Monster from the past, yeah. and, and they really, you know, I mean, I, I think we've tried very, very hard in series one to make the Daleks seem like a really credible force, and, you know, they, and you lose Chris Absolute at the end of it because of it. And then series two, it's all about the Cybermen. Cybermen, 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 you have four Cybermen episodes. And the fourth episode is actually to say, actually, you know what, three Daleks, take them all out in a moment, they're actually rubbish comparatively, moving on. That's you know, a very, very odd thing to do. Um, Cybermen, I felt, ought to be. It ought to be a bit more of an equal match, and that would have been. I mean, it's, and it is very, very witty. I mean, like, like the pest control. Right? It, it, it would have worked for me if you had a rematch <coughs> and sort of you know, a Dalek, or a bunch of Daleks take on a bunch of Cybermen, lots of explosions, dust. Yeah. And then the dust clears, and there's a Cybermen that we upgrade in, bang, and kick back. I mean, I, 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 I do have a side. I, I have a side problem with the with the obvious idea in Doctor Who that Daleks are best. You know, because I don't see why they should be. I mean, they're just, yeah, you know, they're just, they're just yeah, yeah. I mean, also because they they've actually lost more times than anyone else. It's it's that kind of the, our view of the series colours what happens in the series, and it, again, it's not a new thing. It's like looking with respect to the first Doctor and the three Doctors. You, it's respect to the actor rather than respect to the first Doctor, because he, in many ways, was the worst and most impractical Doctor of the three of them, but they defer <coughs> to his... That's right. It, you know, he, is the, he is, in a sense, the youngest Doctor. He screws up far more than Doctors two and three. He blunders around, he fails, his companions die, but they are deferring to him on the screen about what to do, and he's telling them what to do. That is Terence Dix's idea of respect to, yes. to, 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 to William Hartnell. And again, it always covers it, because the Daleks are the first, and the Daleks are this Dalek mania, and we think they're the best, because Terry Nation thinks they're the best, and everyone else thinks, and they've got more toys than Simon. Yeah. Uh, and again, you cannot, allow, you, you cannot stop real life filtering in to mm. your um, television series, because we live in the real life, and it's we who write it and scrub it. And we, yeah. 
you can't stop it really. Yeah, we have to start wrapping up now, sadly. But before we go, um, what do you think? Let's <coughs> finish where we started. Okay. What do you think Trouton's legacy will be for generations discovered to come? Um, uh, he's really great. I mean, it's fairly simple, I suppose. The fact we've got the show now is <coughs> the legacy of Patrick Trouton. This is the first handover. But the fact actually that you watch the things back, I mean, he is a doctor who is in black and white only, and yet I've been able to show <coughs> new, new series watching children trout and stuff, and they find him mesmerizing. And that's the thing, is that he looks to them immediately like this is something like going back to, to flickering days of you know, the 19th century, but he's immediately very, very engaging. And I think that he'll always be engaging. Yeah, I say what Stephen Moffat says. If he hadn't have been as good as he was, we wouldn't have a series today. Yeah. And in many sense, he defined the character of the Doctor more than William Hartnell. It's because the first Doctor is so different from all the others. I mean, he's just trying to survive. He is. He's almost like a different character to all the Doctors that went after. And the person who defined what the Doctor was for now. It's Patrick, and it's a Matt Smith <coughs> loves Patrick Trout. Yeah. Peter Davis loves Patrick Trout. Colin Baker wanted to be Patrick Trout. They all go back to Pat because he defined Doctor Who for them. And you can't recreate William Hartnell's performance because he was the first Doctor and, and, and he started the story. But as a character, you always go back to Pat. Yeah. yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again. <laughs>